and, and, and let's just get this straight. God doesn't care about Republicans or Democrats. He cares about people. It doesn't matter. It's not Republicans and Democrats and independents or whoever else. God is king over all the earth and he cares about people. He doesn't care about the, the, the things that we call ourselves. He cares about the truth, about his word, about the kingdom of Christ. Those are the things that God cares about and that's what God is doing. I wanna thank all you men who have served and women who have served in our military, you veterans. If our veterans would stand, uh, and some of you are on the video, some of you may not. If you're a veteran, would you stand? Uh, and so we can just thank the Lord for you this morning. I'll have to say some of you have changed over the years a little bit. <laughs> As we all have, I know, but we are thankful for our veterans today, uh, thankful for our country that God has us in. Uh, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Daniel. We're going to, uh, this, this, the message today has been over eight years in the making uh, and uh, something that uh, I've sensed from the Lord for uh, over eight years. And, and as I was praying, we're going to take a break from Luke for a few weeks and with Christmas uh, as well. And we're gonna take a few weeks in Daniel and then we'll have a Christmas series. And then after the turn of the year, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, conclude with Luke. We're in 20, chapter 21 there. But um, if you have your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter four, uh, we're gonna, if you'll stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, we're gonna read verse one through three and then verse 10 through 17. Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. In verse 10, now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong and its height reached to the sky and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches and all living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, and the new grass of the field, and let them, him be drenched with the dew of heaven." Let him share with a beast in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of angelic watchers and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Let's pray. Father, you are the king of all kings. Your kingdom, Lord, endures throughout all generations. Lord, I pray this morning that we will see and know in our souls that you are sovereign God and king over all the earth. There's no other gods, there's no other leaders, there's no other ones to worship. Lord, you rule and you reign and you direct all things according to your will. And I pray, Lord, that we will see the greatness of who you are as we look at your word this morning. And God, that we would surrender our lives to you, the sovereign king. 
And God, that we would see that all things that are happening, Lord, are because you are moving all things to the end that you have already uh, designed and has already happened in your mind. And so, Lord, we praise you this morning. And Lord, I ask you that you would help me, Holy Spirit, as I preach your word. Lord, that your word would break through every life that's here. Lord, there's sins and struggles and and there's all kinds of things in people's lives today that are seen and many that are unseen. But Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will take your word and break through in every life, every mind, every heart, every person, whether sitting here or online today. God, that you would be glorified, that we would humble ourselves before you and we would follow your will and your plan in your way. And so Lord, we submit to you and to the working of your spirit and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So as we think about Daniel here, we're gonna, the next three weeks, look at chapter four, five, and six. Uh, and just to, as a reminder, Israel and Judah had been split as kingdoms because of their sin. David had reigned, then Solomon, and because of Solomon having a thousand wives, still can't figure that one out, uh, he sinned against God. He began to worship idols, and God declared, and he warned through the prophets that if you don't turn from your sin, that I will send you into captivity. Israel after they were split and Judah continued to worship idols. They continued to follow after their own lusts. They would not submit to God and his ways and his word. And so God said, fine, you can have your own way. And he sent them into captivity. God sent his people into captivity to Babylon. So that's what's happening. They're taken and, and God has declared for 70 years that they would be uh, captives of Babylon and they would be under that control. And then after 70 years, God would bring them out of that. As we think about this chapter, so that's Israel is here in Babylon. Daniel, he was taken, they most believe around, he was 15 years old when he was taken captive uh, and he was brought into Babylon and, and God worked through him because he honored uh, the Lord in all of his life and he obeyed God's word and God raised him up uh, to power in this uh, pagan land. And he was a powerful uh, a uh, very wise uh, man that God had raised up to be under several kings in this uh, empire. Uh, and so that's what's happening. But Nebuchadnezzar is important that we, we understand this guy. Babylon was the greatest kingdom on the earth at this time. Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the earth. Uh, and the purpose, and I want you to see, so just consider this guy who is absolute monarch over the earth, the most powerful man in the world. And he says, and here's why, what chapter four is about, the purpose, Nebuchadnezzar is sending this out to the kingdoms, to his kingdom, to all the people under him all over the earth. He sends this message in chapter four to them, And so that's the purpose of this chapter. So if you look with me in, in chapter 4, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me, so here's the purpose of chapter 4 of, of what's being said, to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. So that's the purpose. And so as we, as we look at Daniel, uh, the book, Daniel, the book, is really like uh, to the Old Testament. It's like revelation in the New Testament is with all the prophecies and all that's there. That's what Daniel is to the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. There's much more in Daniel than just being him being thrown to a lion in a lion's den. There's much more happening. There's much more that God is doing and God is saying. Uh, and so as we, we look at this passage and this king, 
the, the point that is made over and over and over, and not just here but in other places, is that God is sovereign ruler over all mankind. He is sovereign. That means he is total control. Whatever he wants happens. And he is over all things, all peoples, all nations. It doesn't matter if they believe in him or not. He is sovereign over all things. And so that is the the purpose here in what God's going to show all the nations through this king, through Nebuchadnezzar. So look with me uh, there in chapter 4 in verse 17. I'm just going to point out a few of these, of this this being the purpose that this is written. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living, that's everybody alive on the earth, they may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. He bestows on it whom he wishes. He sets over it the lowliest of men. And then if you look down in verse 25, that you may be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you be given grass to eat. This is God's, what God said was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. You be given grass to eat like cattle, be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you. Now look what he says, until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whomever he wishes. And then in verse 32, in the, about halfway down, you will be given grass to eat like cattle. Seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whomever he wishes. And then in verse 34, But at the end of the period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? And then if you look with me, uh, also verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. And then in chapter 2, if you look over in chapter 2, verse 20, Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And then in verse 28 of the same chapter, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. And so God is the one giving instruction. And then in chapter 6, verse 25 to 27. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. His his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And so just wanted to show there's a few, there's more, but that God is the king, ruler, and has sovereignty. He's not just a king that can't control everything. He is the king of all things. He he is sovereign ruler over all things, all peoples, all times, all of history. Before God created the heavens and the earth, not evolution, God spoke it into being because he's God and that's what he did. Before there was a heavens and an earth, there was God and only God. There was nothing but him for all eternity past. 
Just think about that for a few minutes and you your, your have smoke start coming out of your ears trying to figure that out. God is infinite. He is eternal. He has always been. When he spoke the world into being, he spoke it into being even with the end in mind already because God is not bound by time as we are. He looks at all things at once. And when he began the beginning in Genesis 1, the end was already done. It was already finished. And all God does is he's working all things to his desired end that he has already determined. And he is sovereign and it's important. Again, this is not you or me saying this. This is the most powerful man on the planet. And as God worked in his life to show him who was truly the king of heaven and who was truly king over the realm of mankind. And it's important that we understand that this morning. That when we look at the things of the world, when we look at things like this last week with the election and all the the craziness of people, that there is a king on the throne of heaven who rules all things. And he is God, and he will do what he wants. And he doesn't care if we like it or not. He doesn't care what we think. He will do what he wants, for he is God. And if you're the one true God, you get to do whatever you want. Amen? That's who he is. That's what he's going to show Nebuchadnezzar. I want us to think a moment just to, to give you some background in this. Nebuchadnezzar's greatness. He's the most powerful man on the planet. And we see that in verse 20 to 22. He talks about that uh, in, in David, I mean, sorry, Daniel, when he's speaking uh, in verse 20 of chapter 4. The tree that you saw, this is Daniel speaking, which became large and grew large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all under which the beasts of the field and dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. So God says that about King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the most powerful man on the planet. He was an absolute monarch. There's no one who could challenge him. He wasn't just a monarch. He was a warrior king. He actually got in a chariot and went to battle with his armies. And he was also had a brilliant mind. Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt his father's palace. Can you pull those? Oh, you got them up. And just scroll through those, read. He built his, rebuilt his father's palace, built two more palaces. He built 17 religious temples. He, uh, if you, the uh, Marduk was this great ziggurat that he built. If you remember one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon, that was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was brilliant. And on, on the, all the things that he built, almost every brick said, I am King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, on almost every brick of every building. So the guy's pretty prideful. <laughs> he thought a lot about himself, <laughs> right? And so he does all these things. He built the Ishtar gates. He built canals to facilitate uh, commerce. Babylon was the kingdom of all kingdoms, great wealth. What's interesting about this too, and, and if you were here in the spring when Dr. McMurtry was here, that on, on his temples and the things that he built, there were lions and bulls and dragons. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Lions and bulls, those are real creatures that we know, and so were dragons back then contrary to evolution and all of that uh, garbage. We'll use that word garbage since our president used it, right? <laughs> Let's not throw that in there. <laughs> so uh, at not only an absolute monarch, the greatest builder of that time with the most brilliant mind. So just try to consider, I mean, if you remember in, in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they would not bow down to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had made, 
he gets so angry that he takes him and throws him in a fiery furnace. This is a guy that if he just was having a bad day, you're dead and nobody could say anything. This is the kind of power this guy had. God's gonna take this man and he's gonna make him eat grass like a cow. And I want you to consider that, the, the greatness of God. And, and this is what we read where Nebuchadnezzar comes from this is that God can humble anyone he wants. And here is this man with all power and God takes away his reason, God takes away his kingdom, and he makes him eat grass like a cow for seven years. It's crazy. It's amazing what God can do. So if you look there in chapter 4, verse 13, we read this in the opening where the angel says in verse 14, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit, let the beast flee from under it and the birds of, from its branches. So when, when, he, when this dream that he had that God gave him about the beautiful tree and the birds resting in the branches and all the animals were fed from it. That is a picture that all the nations of the earth, they profited from Babylon. Babylon's greatness provided for all the nations and they rested in its strength. And here, when, when the angel declares what God has said, chop down the tree, Strip off the foliage. All the nations will run from it. Verse 15, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it. In the grass of the field, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his mind, verse 16, be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. In verse second part of verse 17, in order that the living may know that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows on it whom he wishes. And then if you look in verse 24 and 25, this is where Daniel is interpreting the dream. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the most high, which has come upon my Lord, the king that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. You be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows on it whomever he wishes. And then in verse 28, All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. So Daniel gives him the interpretation. Verse 29, 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and says, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as, as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you and until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows on it whomever he wishes. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me. So consider this morning, this greatness of this king. You, you know, sometimes we think we're something, right? People think, look at what I've done. You know, we could even look at whether it's Elon Musk or NASA, we've gone to the moon or we can catch rockets or, you know, and God scoffs at that, right? I mean, you realize that, right? God who spoke the universe into being, billions of galaxies containing billions of stars. Like you look at, you know, in the, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the earth from the Hubble telescope when it was just passing through and it's a speck of dust. That's what it looks like. 
Well, you compare the earth to the universe that God marks with a span, that God spoke into existence, that Isaiah says that God holds every one of those stars by his own power and knows them all by name. When you look at the earth, it's a speck of dust. Now find you out of over 7 billion people on the speck of dust. We're, we're really small. Does that make sense? It's almost like the, you know, the, uh, the Grinch movie where, you know, the whole thing takes place on a snowflake, right? I mean, we don't realize how tiny we are compared to a great God. And to, and to take Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest man in all the earth, and make him eat grass like a cow is nothing for God. And it's important that we understand this because the point of what God's doing, and, and God cares about Nebuchadnezzar. That's why he does this in his life. And he does it to humble him and bring him as low as he had to go so that he would lift his eyes to heaven and recognize that God is ruler over all things. And everything you have and everything I have is not ours. It's his. It belongs to God. You and I own nothing. And we need to understand that. God owns it all. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. They're his. We are only stewards of what is God's. And it is so important that we understand that because one of the lessons is this, is understand if you don't humble yourself before the, the living God, he will humble you. And he can make you eat grass like a cow or me if he wants to. That's what he did here. Because God will not share his glory with anyone because he is the one true living God. And we can humble ourselves before him or we can let him humble us. And I can tell you from experience, you don't want him humbling you because it's no fun at all. But he will do it because he cares about us, just like he cared about Nebuchadnezzar. So the most powerful man on earth, the great warrior, the greatest mind, is instantly degraded to a cow. Why? Because God is making sure that Nebuchadnezzar knows who is in control. And that's what he tells him and says here in verse 16 and 17. We've read several places, God keeps saying the same thing, right? That you will know that I rule over the realm of mankind, that all the living will know this. So Nebuchadnezzar and all the living will know who rules over mankind, who alone is the kingdom of heaven, and that God will humble whoever he wants to. You know, and, and this is such an important lesson for us. We can, you know, lift ourselves up in pride. We can attack someone or, or we can think we're something. I mean, even Paul says, if you think you're something, you better be careful because you'll fall. Proverbs says, pride comes before the fall. Pride was the sin of Satan that let, got him kicked out of heaven. Pride was the sin of Eve who wanted to be like God. And pride is the thing that dominates mankind today. We don't want that God. We don't want one way. We'll come up with our own way, right? Well, I don't like what the Bible says. The Bible tells us how to live our lives. The Bible tells how the church is supposed to operate. Well, I don't like that. God doesn't care if you like it or not. He doesn't care if I like it. He is sovereign. And our, what we are to do is su to submit to God and his word. And we live our lives based on the word of God. How do we follow Christ? How do we love God and, and follow him? Well, Jesus said in John 15, by obeying his word. That's how you follow the Lord. That's how you delight in God. That's how the, as we live godly lives in a, in a pagan land is we obey the word of God. We do what it says. We allow it to govern how we live. And so God is doing this in Nebuchadnezzar's life and then in verse 34 through 37 of chapter 4 
God restores the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. He humbles himself. Nebuchadnezzar, if you look there, we read in verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what God, and, and this is what God will do in your life. He will bring all kinds of things into your life until you do, until I do what Nebuchadnezzar did right here in 34. He looked up to heaven. God will bring people to the lowest point so they have nowhere else to look but up to God and what he wants. And that's what happens here in verse 34. I raised my eyes toward heaven. And what happened right after that? My reason returned to me. Once Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself and recognized who was king, then God immediately restored him, gave him his reason back right there. And I bless the most high. What happens? Nebuchadnezzar praises God who lives forever and ever. Look down in verse 36. At that, at that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. Now look what happens. This is important. My counselors and my nobles began seeking me out so I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. So God gives him his reason back. Do you think when the kingdom had been taken away for seven years and now God's gonna give it back, you think people were excited about that? They're probably pretty mad. I mean, if you gained power and now all of a sudden it's gonna be taken away, would you like that? Does America like that? No, it doesn't. And so not only does God bring Nebuchadnezzar's mind back and reason back, but he brings the kingdom. He, he gives him the kingdom back. How does he do that? His nobles and his counselors return to him and seek him out. And he's restored as king. Does that kind of remind you of somebody that we know? who was leader over this nation and then it was taken and then it was handed back. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? That's why I said this, is, this message is eight years coming. I remember when we were in Indiana when, when Trump ran against Hillary and I mean, the whole world was like, what is going on in America, right? And, and then after, it was interesting because, I mean, I think all of us, if you've any, watched any of the news back there in 2016, man, that guy reminded me a lot of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Proud, arrogant. I mean, how many times have we watched President Trump say, hey, you know, look what I've done. I'm the best. I've done this. When I was president, it was always the best, right? Lots of pride. And that's why a lot of people don't like him because he's very prideful. He was. But what did God do in his life? He took it all away. He humbled him. And to the point of within a millimeter, he had lost his life. God brought him down to the bottom. And, and you can ask Ruth, Tuesday morning, I said to Ruth, this past Tuesday morning, I said, you know, I really think that Trump's gonna win because I think that he, God is doing in his life what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. And God not only gave him the, king, the, the leadership of our country back, he did it in a, a, according to a, a Democrat who has a show on ESPN, it was an annihilation. It was overwhelming. Popular vote, electoral vote, no one could say anything. You know what's interesting as I was watching the news? All over the world, the leaders of the world said this is the greatest political comeback in all of history, of all of known history anywhere. Not just in America, but all over the world. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because if you remember, after he lost and all the stuff that happened, he just faded out of everything, right? But then all of a sudden, leaders began to seek him out again. And God gave him back the leadership 
of this country. I want, I want you to think about that because as we think about the point here with Nebuchadnezzar is that God is sovereign. God is in control of all things. He puts up kings and he takes them out. Even a leader of our nation whose cognitive decline goes where he can't lead anymore. God is over all things. America doesn't understand that because we don't want God. We want our own God. We want to live our own lives. We want to do our own thing. But, but just consider the whole Russia hoax, the two impeachments, the court cases, the trying to destroy all his businesses, two assassination attempts, all the slander and lies. There's never been anything seen like it, right? And, and I'm not here to be political, but we need to let God's word show us what's happening in our country, right? You think about the last eight years of everything that has been done, the whole, the, the most powerful people on the planet, not just America. There, there's many more powerful people in the world that have this same agenda and they wanted to take him out. And I mean, can you imagine? I, I mean, I look at, at our president-elect and I go, I don't know how, this guy's 78 years old and he eats McDonald's every day. Like, how does he, how can he withstand what he's withstood? Because God is sovereign over kings, over rulers and leaders and all people. God kept him from dying. God kept him from being thrown in jail. He made him stand in the midst of all of the, I mean, they brought out everything, even all of our tax dollars. They brought out everything to put him away, and yet he's still there. I'm sure they're, I mean, and you, if you watch any of the news, I mean, they're just, they don't understand what happened. America doesn't get that there's a God in heaven, and he's doing what he wants. What they meant for evil, for, for Trump, and, and whether you like him or not, I'm, this is not about whether we like him or not. This is about looking at what has happened and understanding who's in control. What they meant for evil, God meant for good. All these leaders, greatest political comeback of all time. And, and God made the victory so great. You know, all the Democrats had all kinds of lawyers set up that if it was close or there was any question, they were going to attack. I mean, that's a fact. It was so one-sided, nobody could say anything. Is that just chance? We don't believe in chance. If you're a Christian, we believe in the one true God. Amen? And, and, and let's just get this straight. God doesn't care about Republicans or Democrats. He cares about people. It doesn't matter. It's not Republicans and Democrats and independents or whoever else. God is king over all the earth, and he cares about people. He doesn't care about the, the, the things that we call ourselves. He cares about the truth, about his word, about the kingdom of Christ. Those are the things that God cares about, and that's what God is doing. So just like Nebuchadnezzar, God took away his leadership, humbled him, then gave it back. He faded to nothing, then his leaders began to seek him out. He came out of nowhere, and that's from all the leaders all over the world. So what's God doing? Why would God do that? I mean, even if you're sitting here today and you're like, I can't stand that guy. I mean, I just hate to watch, watch him talk on the news. So what, what is God doing? This is so important. God cares about his people and his mission. I said this a couple weeks ago. You had one candidate that hates Israel and hates the church. And she made that very clear. That was one of the clearest things she said in the last three months. And you have another one that loves Israel and loves God's people. And he's made that clear over the last eight years. Even though whether he is a believer or not, who knows? But he has made that clear. 
And so God cares about his people. How do we know that? Look at the last 8,000 years of human history. You know, people, people say, well, you know, we need somebody, you know, he's just vile and he's just arrogant. And has God ever used pagan kings in history? I mean, let's think about Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar would make President Trump look like Mother Teresa. Seriously. What about King Cyrus? What about King Artaxerxes? What about Herod? What about Caesar? God has used pagan kings and rulers throughout all of human history for one reason. His people, his people, God doesn't love all the world the same. You know, I told the students this last Wednesday night. I love all of our teens, but I don't love them as much as I do my family. God loves the world, but his love for his people is very, very different. God has always used rulers either to exalt or to humble his people. And every time he does, it's always for the purpose of the coming kingdom of Christ. I mean, you look back to Ruth and, and uh, Boaz and, and back in the, with the Moabites and all that story and, and all that God did to bring this whole thing about. Why? So that there would, could be the line of the Messiah would continue. And, and every time when, when we see what God is doing in his word, and sometimes we go, what is he doing? I don't get it. And, and I know there's people all over America today and going, and all over the world going, what is happening in America? Well, God has already determined the end, and he's moving everything to that end. And, and we have to understand that he is the one who is in control, and God cares for you. He cares for his people, and he cares about his mission. God's mission is that the gospel will go to the nations. You understand that America is not God's chosen nation. I hope you understand that today. The only chosen nation ever in history is Israel. But God has chosen a people called the church and called us out of darkness. And he loves us and he cares for us and he's working all things in the world and through all of time and space for his people, for his mission, because Christ is coming. That's what it's always about. That's the thread through all of, of redemptive history, through all of the scripture. That is the thread of all the crazy stuff happening in the Old Testament and all the stuff we're seeing. There's this thread that runs through it. That's what God is doing. And whatever will either bless God's people or if God's people like Israel and Judah, they, we persist in our own sin, then God will take a king or a ruler or a leader, a president, and he will humble his people. That's where we are in Daniel because of their sin, because of their obstinance, because they would not bow to the word of God. He said, fine, I will humble you just like he did with Nebuchadnezzar. That's what God is doing. I mean, think about it. Remember when Kamala Harris said, when people yelled at her to rally Jesus as Lord, and she mocks God and laughs and says, you're at the wrong rally. What happens when people mock God? Think about the Titanic. God can't sink this ship Man, if somebody said that, I'm not getting on that boat, <laughs> right? When you mock and blaspheme God, he will deal with that pride. Remember what David said when he fought Goliath? You have blasphemed the living God, and he is going to give you to me, and I will cut off your head. And what happened? 
that very thing. Why? Because Goliath blasphemed and mocked the living God. So God will humble his people. God is working to move his people to the end of of what God is doing. God is working to move all things so the gospel spreads across the nations. America doesn't get it, but does the church get it? Do we understand what is happening around us? Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Jews, you can look at the weather. You can see the signs of of summer and fall and bad weather coming, but you don't see the signs of what's happening all around you. God expects us to know what's going on. And so we need to, that's why we're going to take three weeks and, and look at, you know, America is still a pagan nation. And just because Trump won the election, that doesn't mean things are going to get better. You understand that, right? If the church continues to walk in sin, God will humble his people. And isn't that what he's been doing since 9-11? of 2001 with the World Trade Towers? If you look from that moment, all the things that have happened since 9-11, September 11, 2001, you see these, these judgments, these warnings from God. And what's interesting is before this election, the church all over the country was praying. Why? Because we knew what would happen if a certain person won and where this would go. And that the church would be hated. And so God's people humbled themselves and prayed. Wow, sounds like Second Chronicles, doesn't it? But I want you to see as we think about what God is doing, that God is working on our behalf in the world And whether that's to move us forward or to humble us. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now look what it says. Who gave himself for us to what? redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The the Bible calls the church God's special treasure. God passionately loves his people. And Christ came and died on a cross to rescue us and redeem us back to himself, to to call out. You remember what Jesus said in John 10? When the shepherd calls, his people come. When Jesus Christ calls and, and God draws someone for salvation, they come because they're his and they know the voice of their shepherd. And God has called out this people and it's called the church That's what church means, called out ones. He has called us out. And in Colossians 1, it says, he took us out of the kingdom of darkness and put us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he's taken this people that he bought with his own blood. That's what Paul said in Acts 20. He has purchased us with his own blood, the God of heaven. And he loves his people. And he will take all of heaven and earth and he will move it for the sake of his people and the glory of his name. We are the treasure of the living God, not because we're good, not because we have any wisdom, not because we have anything, but because he has called us out of darkness. He has rescued us in his own blood on the cross. He rose from the dead, declaring that I am Lord of heaven and earth. I am Lord of the living and the dead. And you are my people, and I have a purpose for you, and that is what I am doing in all of history and time. It's about the church. It's about once we're gone, we're taken out, that God 
will bring Israel back to himself and he will set up a kingdom upon the earth. I mean, look at Ephesians chapter two. I mean, we know this, for by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works so that no one can boast. Now look at verse 10, for we are what? His masterpiece. That's what workmanship means. We are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would just walk in them. He is sovereign, he is king, and he is working on behalf of his people. America is not God's chosen nation. The church is. We have to, to understand what God has given us. And God uses all nations to bring about the kingdom of Christ. That's what Daniel's all about. I mean, look, look with me again at chapter 2 at verse 35. Is this really what God's doing? This is the... the the, the vision, the dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar of the statue. Verse 35, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the weird wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue become a, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So the statues, just in case you don't know, the statue and all that, the head of gold, that was Nebuchadnezzar, and then each part represented a real, literal kingdom. Not a spiritual one, a real kingdom that we have seen in history of mankind. And then it says there's a stone that comes out of the earth, this mountain, and it comes and it hits the, the statue at its feet and crushes it. And that's the kingdom of Messiah. That's a real kingdom, not a spiritual one, a real literal kingdom. And it crushes all the nations, all the different kingdoms that have survived throughout the earth. Look down in chapter two, verse 44 and 45. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all the kingdoms, but will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And then if you flip over to chapter 7 in verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And then same chapter, verse 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That's what Daniel's about, what God's doing in the history of all the kingdoms of the earth for his people, for his glory. And he reigns over all things. So when I ask you this morning, do you get it? Does the church understand these things? You know, America reeks with pride. I mean, you can look at Romans 1 and see down at the end where they're given over to a reprobate mind. And you can see that in our country. And America just thumbs their nose at God and we don't care what you say. We're going to do what we want. 
But do you? I want to remind you this morning that your very breath is a gift from God. We know this. We've had friends and loved ones that were all their everything's great, and then just like that, their lives are gone, or their lives are forever changed through an accident or something that happens, right? Or maybe Hurricane Helene. Or maybe a tsunami if you're in another part of the world. And, and it's important that we understand everything you have, even your breath, is a gift from God. You don't own it. And he can take it whenever he wants. The wages of sin is death. We have a debt to God and he can call us on it anytime he wants and if we have not repented and trusted in Christ when he calls on that debt it's literal hell to pay will you humble yourself before God today or are you going to make him humble you will we listen to the words of Nebuchadnezzar will we listen to History. I mean, don't we know the saying, those who don't learn from history are what? Doomed to repeat it. So what do we do? I mean, God has shown America mercy, amen? He has shown us mercy. So, so what do we do? Well, in Daniel 4, Daniel gives Nebuchadnezzar some advice. In verse 27 of chapter four, it says, therefore, O king, may my advice, Daniel was, he was terrified for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was a proud, arrogant king. Daniel loved him and he cared. And, and here's, look what he says. My advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. What does Daniel say? Nebuchadnezzar, turn from your sins and do what is right. Obey the word of God. Doesn't that sound like 2 Chronicles 7, 14? When, when Solomon dedicates the temple and God says, when you find yourself in bondage because of your sin, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's the same advice that Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the advice I want to give you today. It doesn't matter just because maybe someone that you like was elected president does not mean that America will be okay and you can just go back to comfort and ease. There's a warning here that we need to turn from our sins and seek the face of God. And follow him. We need to rejoice today in the mercy of God that he's had on us. Not just this week, but for the last 250 years. Amen? God has shown us mercy. I mean, there's been atrocities done in America and for 250 years. And God has shown mercy. Why? Because of the church and Israel. God said, I mean, if you, do, you be, do you believe that this is the word of God? Do you this morning? Genesis 12, God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. We saw that this week. God cares about his people in Israel, and that's what he's doing. And, and it's important that through all the atrocities and the bad things that have happened in the history of America, God has, I remember the pastor I worked with several years ago, he said the, the reason America still stands is because they still support Israel. 
And God has promised that he would bless those who bless Israel. That's God's word. That's not my opinion. That's not me making something up. That is the word of God. That's the promise. And you can see that throughout history. And I mean, think about, I mean, think about Abraham and, and what the promises that God made to him about his seed, the Messiah that would come and, and those who would bless him and all those things. And God has kept that. And, and so, you know, as we, we consider what's happening, it's important that we understand that if the church does not wake up in America and turn from our sins, things aren't getting any better. Amen? You remember what God said to Josiah, King Josiah? He said, I am going to destroy Jerusalem, but because you have humbled yourself and wept before me, I will push it back. He still destroyed Jerusalem after Josiah was gone. And when the church, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn from our wicked ways, Monday night, this place should have been packed. Somehow in America, the church doesn't think that we need to pray. We have people praying during the service. And if you want to join and be part of people praying during this service, talk to Bob, our elder Bob Gleam. He's leading that. Our life groups pray. God's people have got to humble ourselves and pray. And not just that, but I want to challenge you this morning that we have to turn from our sins, broken relationships, Pride, arrogance, lust, all the sins, immorality, worshiping other things besides the Lord, all those things God's calling his people to turn away from. And I'm telling you, if we don't do it, the church in America, it's, God's going to do what he said he would do. He's given us a chance to humble ourselves and to turn to him. Will we do it? Will we do it? Will the church in America do it? Jeremiah 29, God says this. This is about Israel and Judah and Babylon. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you. This, God loves his people, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. But look what it says. What We all love verse 11. But look at the next verse. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me. How? With all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And look what happens when we, when we seek him with all of our heart. I will restore your fortunes. We'll gather you from all the nations and from the places where I have driven you. We want God to bless America. We want to do good to America, even though America is not my kingdom. My kingdom is the kingdom of Christ. I'm a citizen of heaven before I'm a citizen of America. I'm a Christian. I've been pulled into another kingdom but we still want to do good for the place that we live. That's good and right in God's sight. But when we, if we want to do good for our country, if we want to do good for our community, then we've got to come back to what God has called us to do. And we also got to get to work. Because when you look at Daniel and you look at this book and that every, all those kingdoms, all those literal kingdoms throughout all of history, King Herod the Great, all of those are there. And they've all passed. And everything is leading to when Christ will set up his kingdom on earth and rule. And, and then the whole universe will be the kingdom of God at the very end. Everything is heading that way. And we need to get on board with what God's doing. Our job as the church has not changed. We have a mission. We have a gospel that's supposed to be proclaimed. 
to the nations. We are to continue in that because that's God's plan. And I want to say again as we close, will you humble yourself this morning before God or will you make him humble you? Please humble yourself. Are you outside God's kingdom this morning? Are you, are you on the outside? Not have you prayed a prayer or sat in a church all your life. Have you been born again? Have you come all the way to Christ that he rules your life? Or are you on the outside? We all deserve judgment, but God has shown us mercy. In Ephesians chapter two, verse four, He's talking about that we were children of wrath and then Paul says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And I wanna say to you this morning, are you on the out? Do you know that you're born again? Do you, do you know that you're in, in God's kingdom, that you belong to him? If you don't and you're on the outside, those two great words, but God, God because of his great love, because of his great compassion, because of his great mercy, he came after us. Do you see it? The God who rules heaven, the one who made Nebuchadnezzar eat grass like a cow, he came to this earth to rescue you. His love and his mercy is infinite. And and if, if you will humble yourself this morning and turn from your sin and embrace Christ with your life, turn your life over to him, he will show you mercy and he will forgive all of your sins, even the ones you haven't done yet, and he will make you right with himself, and you will be his child, in his household, in his kingdom, his special treasure. But you must humble yourself, or he will humble you. And if you know the Lord this morning, are you loving him with all your heart? Is he the focus in what you're seeking with your life? Humble yourself and do God's way, God's plans, God's ways. You know, I read this morning that King David, when he's given the kingdom and he, they're bringing the ark in before the Lord and they're all worshiping God. They're praising, they're dancing, they're, they're worshiping God. But you know what David did? He brought the ark in on a cart. How did God command them to bring the ark in? The Levites carrying it with poles. And the ark tipped. And Uzzah reached out and he touched the ark and God struck him dead because he didn't do God's plans, God's ways. We are to do his plans, his ways. We can be as sincere as we want to be. This morning, are you allowing the word of God to dictate every aspect of your life? That's what we need to see. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. God, thank you for our time this morning. God, thank you for the example of Nebuchadnezzar. And God, I just pray that as we look at, Lord, how do we counter in this culture? How do we thrive as a believer in this culture? Lord, that, that is pagan, that there's many gods, Lord, many idols all through this land. But Lord, how do we thrive here? Lord, help us to see it's as we humble ourselves and we follow you and we walk in your ways. And God, we allow you to lead us and we follow And Lord, Lord, help us to take the warning from Daniel and from Nebuchadnezzar. Lord, you are the king of heaven. And Lord, even as we look at the election from this last week to realize, Lord, as as there was so much done to, to take someone out, and yet, Lord, you made him stand. 
because there's some purpose that you have and that you're doing. And, and Lord, help us to see, Lord, again, even with the election or as we look at history, as we look at your word, Lord, help us to see again that you are sovereign over all things. And Lord, may we be on board with you and what you're doing. And God, give us wisdom to understand the days that we live in and what you're calling us to do. Lord, may we be a people on our knees in prayer. May we be a people, Lord, who's working hard with the gospel. Lord, taking the gospel to the nations. And Lord, may we be a people that loves and honors and worships you, recognizing, Lord, that all that we have is a gift from you and that we are stewards of these things that you gave us for your glory. And Lord, I pray that you would just encourage and strengthen your people as we see, God, the great love that you have for us and that you move heaven and earth for the sake of your people to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name.